I am an engineering student. And today, I will share with you what happens when engineers stop caring about technology. But first, let me give you a few examples of how engineers and consumers get obsessed about new things. This is the phone tooth. Back in 2002, it was a new kind of cell phone that was smaller, stealthier, and way cooler. It was featured by Time magazine as invention of the year and, and reached out to the imagination of many consumers. The phone tooth was what the conventional cell phone wasn't, small and discreet. But did the technology succeed? Well, just like a normal tooth, a phone tooth would require a surgical procedure to implant. For every upgrade, a new tooth would have to be molded to fit its users perfectly. And charging a device located in your mouth? Well, that would clearly be a challenge. So instead of going for the phone tooth, the public instead decided to use something called the wireless headset. Although the phone tooth was more successful with the media, it was the wireless headset that was actually used by consumers. And as an engineer, I too am guilty of getting obsessed about new things and often find that I sacrifice what people need for what I care about in technology. For example, like most students taking introductory computer science, in my freshman year I had to write a decimal to binary number converter. But after I wrote my very first version, I hated how it worked because I forced my numbers to go through many lines of code to do a simple calculation. So instead of submitting the assignment, I cut it down and improved it. I made it 15 lines from 117. Now I was proud of the code, but it turned out the professor was only looking for this, a program that will use two built-in one-word functions to do the same thing in seconds that it took me half a day to develop. The time I spent on the number converter was in vain because it was fueled by my obsession with making technology smaller. While it allowed me to explore the intricacies of the code, it didn't address a human need that was anybody other than myself. In essence, the phone tooth was the same. It, too, was driven by an obsession with shrinking technology down. It, too, allowed the creators to explore the intricacies of cell phone technology. And it, too, hit the dead end after the very first version. And by dead end, I mean the phone tooth was made, but it looked like this. It was as big as a whole human skull, meaning that both the idea behind the prototype and the prototype itself failed to address an actual human need. But the phone tooth was made a long time ago. Back then, I didn't even know if I was going to be an engineer. I didn't care about technology. Who was I to judge? Well, let's fast forward to my freshman year in college when I signed up for the Drones for Good competition. And in the process of working on a project for this competition, almost made the same mistakes that the creators of the phone tooth did 13 years ago. The Drones for Good competition was organized to recognize excellent drone technologies and was open to universities and organizations alike. I heard a lot about drones in social media and videos, in news articles even. I felt passionate about this technology and as such found this competition to be a perfect opportunity to play around with drones. So as soon as my roommate and I found the link to the competition, we were hooked. In less than 24 hours, we found a faculty mentor to assist us and began doing our research. Among other things, we found TED Talks about drones and were captivated, especially by the quadcopter drone. A quadcopter could carry cargo. It could land on water. Quadcopters were superb at turning into swarms or flying in perfectly choreographed maneuvers. Some were even tied to leashes, which just showed to me further that this technology could evolve in so many different ways. So as engineers, eager about this technology, 
me and my roommate assembled a team of other engineers and went straight to the lab to work on our drone. We began brainstorming existing and non-existing solutions. We came up with a list of sensors, actuators, different electronic equipment that we could put on a drone. We were coming up with crazy ideas, thinking of any application just to finally get our hands on this technology and make it fly. <laughs> but we soon ran into an unforeseen obstacle, our mentor. Our mentor was an engineer just like us, but he was also more thoughtful about the technologies that he used on a daily basis. Our mentor placed a lot more focus on human usability than most student engineers would. So when he saw our excitement about the drone, he knew that we were passionate about improving the technology and not about how these improvements would be used. Because we were excited about the drone, he wouldn't let us use the quadcopter until we found the right application. Instead, he challenged us. He said, present to me an application of drones that describes a future that you would like to live in. To us, a great future was one where quadcopters would dominate the urban space, where technology would permeate every pore of society, and where drones would be doing everything from daily chores to persistently flying through the stratosphere. To us, it seemed that the project stagnated because we were being denied the technology that we wanted to use. But our mentor persisted. Could drones be an application that is safe, he asked. Would it, did, would it be cheaper to employ existing solutions that didn't involve drones? Would it be possible, or even much better, for a certain application to avoid using technology altogether? Our mentor didn't want us to spend thousands of hours and thousands of dollars on ideas that, although sounding cool, would not actually be used by anyone but ourselves. We are very frustrated with our mentor for not letting us use the drone that we wanted to play with all along, but we continued doing our research because we wanted to win the competition. So we found an article about wildlife conservation efforts in a national park in the United Arab Emirates. This national park was called Wadi Wuraya and was featured on the website for Expo 2020. It was declared by the UAE government as the first mountainous national park in the country and was recognized by the Ramsar Convention as a wetland of international importance. We really wanted to check it out. So as a revenge to our mentor, we skipped one of his classes <laughs> and instead went straight to Wadi Wuraya to befriend the researchers and rangers working there. The rangers took us to hidden bat caves, showed us the variety of dragonfly species, and pointed out different mammals that lived in the national park. The capacity of the ecosystem captivated us, proved to us the importance of this region to the Arabian Peninsula, and prompted us to come back again. The next trip we took, however, was no longer just a showcase of the park. Now, we're actually going together with the rangers into the depths of Wadi Wuraya to collect images from camera traps. Camera traps, like the one you see here, are devices that connect the camera with an infrared sensor, allowing the camera to take photographs whenever the sensor detects animal movement. These cameras are located on the ground in strategic places around Wadi Wuraya National Park and allow the rangers to take pictures of animals year-round. These images are crucial for both biological research and wildlife conservation. But because camera traps are often located so deep within the national park, rangers are forced to rent a military helicopter just to get to them. A military helicopter is needed to avoid walking for days and is especially crucial when temperatures in the UAE reach 47 degrees in the summer. I was really excited about the opportunity of this trip to take a military helicopter, but not until we took off did I begin realizing the complexities of the process. Our pilot was flying between tall ridges on an expensive piece of military machinery. We were all carrying large backpacks full of only water, and it was desert summer heat in which all of us was going into the center of the national park 
just to disembark, climb down into the valleys, and walk for several more kilometers in the heat just to gather data from tiny SD memory cards. In just one day, the rangers were spending so much money, taking so much time away from their primary jobs, and spilling so much sweat just to do this, I found it crazy how in the age of digital communication and networks, rangers were still traveling long distances to physically pick up data. But to rangers in Wadi Wurai and many other national parks across the world, communication infrastructure is simply inaccessible, making it only possible to collect the data manually. When me and my teammates were back in the comfort of the lab, we discussed this and came to an agreement. This was a real problem that we wanted to solve. Real people that we met and we wanted to help. And the real technological challenge that we wanted to undertake. Best of all, we knew that we could solve this problem with a quadcopter. So, identifying a real problem propelled our project forward and helped us realize that a drone could be used as a valuable tool for the rangers. We wanted to create a drone that would travel towards a camera trap and wirelessly transfer the images. To achieve this, we developed a transmission system that combined with existing camera traps, allowing them to wirelessly transfer the data to the drone. Now, all the rangers had to do was to tell the drone the GPS coordinates of the camera trap, launch it into the air, and wait for it to return with their data. Thus, what used to be only possible twice a year and was conducted manually, was now possible to be done every month with a drone. We are very excited to finally combine our love for technology with a problem and a solution that matter to both us and to the rangers. But the reality turned out to be different from what we imagined. The quadcopter didn't stand a chance in the large and open space of Wadi Wurai National Park. While a quadcopter could be programmed to do somersaults, to fly in swarms, or to hover in one place, flying for tens of kilometers was not at all practical for this technology. Yes, quadcopters that flew for such a distance could be made, but the cost of such a quadcopter would far exceed the cost of any other solution. Fortunately, identifying a real problem helped us realize what kind of drone was safer, cheaper, and much more suitable for this application. The plane. Plane drones at the time were as advanced as the quadcopter and were about the same size, meaning that the plane became the perfect technology for us to create a data mule drone that would fly into Wadi Wuraya and collect images from any camera trap located in the park. In fact, here's a video of our very first flight in the National Park. Here you can see how easily the drone is launched into the air and travels across the valleys towards a camera trap. At this point, the drone is close enough to the camera trap and is wirelessly downloading the images. During our very first flight, the drone was able to collect 380 camera trap photos from a nearby camera trap and proved to both us and to the rangers that it was indeed possible to use a drone to efficiently and cost-effectively solve a real-world problem in the national park. Making one drone cost us only $1,500, which is just 1% of what rangers spent on average per year on renting a military helicopter. <laughs> the drone impressed not only the rangers, however, but also the judges at the Drones for Good competition. And we won the award. We won because we didn't care about the technology, but instead created a pragmatic solution to a real problem. The judges 
prompted us to further improve the technology. And so now we're in the process of developing the drone and hope that the improvements that we make will be useful and beneficial to rangers and researchers in national parks across the world. But let's look back. When we just started working on the project, we cared and put all our effort into the technology alone. The popularity of the quadcopter diverted our attention from real problems that we needed to be solving. And so, like the creators of the phone tooth, we hit a dead end. It was fun understanding the intricacies of quadcopter technology, but understanding the technology itself led to no useful applications. Yes, by the merit of its existence, technology is important for the progress of humanity. And as an engineering student, I will continue trying to understand and hopefully in the future build new and interesting technologies. But when I get the next opportunity to create a technology that is to be used by people other than myself, I will take the stance that my team took during this competition and I will ensure that the technology I make matters to the world. I will ensure that the service the technology provides is useful to humanity. I will ensure that the next time I have to build a drone, it is because that drone is a solution to a real problem. Thank you. <laughs>